So, good morning. My name is Susan, and I am one of Lama Jempa's students. I've been with Lion's Roar since about 2008, and I'm here this morning to talk about chaplaincy. So, Lama has been referencing chaplaincy a lot in his teachings recently. Um, last Sunday, he was inspired by um, a Buddhist holiday to talk extensively about chaplaincy. And if you had, were not here and you have not had a chance to listen to the talk he gave last Sunday, it is up on YouTube, and I encourage you to listen to it. Um, so today, what I would thought I would talk about is a little bit about my experience practicing chaplaincy in a hospital setting and about the chaplaincy training, the course of study that I uh, took in 2018 and 2019. Um, that sort of started me on this path, uh, on the chaplaincy path, not the Buddhist path. And then Ellen um, has agreed to share some about how she experiences the practice of chaplaincy because it's you know different. We chaplaincy is is practiced in all walks of life. Um, and then we'll have an open forum for questions and comments and sharing um, other chaplaincy experiences and views. So how did I get started on this hospital chaplaincy path? Um, in 2018, I was just kind of floundering. Um, I was feeling at loose ends. Um, and I didn't feel like I was really involved in anything that was allowing me to challenge and to express and to grow my bodhisattva vows. And so as I was talking to Lama in Darshan about this, and, and we had talked about this several times, um, I remembered that he had mentioned a few times over the years about a chaplaincy training program um, called at the Sate Center for Buddhist Studies which is in Redwood City. Uh, actually, his wife, Sabrina, had gone through this training program. And so, like, finally, this light bulb goes off, and I go, oh, here's something that maybe I could do. So, in, in retrospect, you know, I realized that Lama had been kind of guiding me gently, sort of, to get that light bulb to go off, and it just took a while. And the causes and conditions came together, and um, I started on this course of study. So the program is a year-long program, um, and it is based primarily around the 10 paramitas. Um, each month, one of the paramitas, for instance, generosity, is the main topic of conversation. One Saturday a month, the entire class would gather in Redwood City um, for a full day of teaching and discussion and small groups. Um, there are four core teachers in the program and a number of guest teachers who would come in uh, monthly. Um, and they would lecture on the topic of the month and how it manifests in a chaplaincy way. So we had, the rest of the month, we had readings, reflections, and papers to write on um, that topic, generosity, and how generosity manifested in terms of chaplaincy. We also had small groups that would meet either in person, depending uh, on, on where the group was, or online. My group met online, and we would meet monthly to have discussions about the readings that we were doing. Um, we had a few field trips. One of the more memorable ones was to an anatomy lab. So um, nothing like going to an anatomy lab to learn about impermanence and death, right? That was pretty amazing. Uh, and then towards the end of the program, we had a full weekend retreat at um, a place down in Redwood City. So it is a fairly rigorous program, and my experience with the participants, um, and some of us are still in touch, um, was that everybody was really dedicated, um, and particularly the teachers. Um, three of the four teachers were the founding members of this program, 
20 some odd years ago. So they've been teaching for a very long time. There was about 20 of us in the class. Almost everybody was Buddhist, but not everybody. And it's not a requirement to be Buddhist. Um, three of the four teachers were Buddhist um, and very, very highly experienced chaplains in various different settings. So they brought a lot to the program. A core piece of the program was to find a setting for volunteer work as a chaplain right from the start. So the program starts in September. And by October, we were expected to have a place where we could vo do volunteer work. So um, I had previously volunteered at UC Davis Med Center in their hospice program for four or five years. So I was pretty familiar with the Med Center. And um, so I, that's where I went to first to see if they had a spot for chaplaincy volunteers. And as it turns out, they have a very robust program, um, chaplaincy program, training program. And so, and they're always looking for volunteers. So I was fortunate to um, already have an association with that institution and I could just pop right in. So that's how I ended up at UCD. Um, what all of the lectures and the readings and the discussions were really pointing towards was a forming and a by, uh, an embodying of what they called a personal dharmology, a personal theology. So a theology that was based in the Dharma. Basically, what is it that I believe and what do I trust in spiritual terms? What do I rely on for energy, for inspiration, and for balance? To do this work, no matter what the setting is, um, is really vital to be grounded and guided by a personal theology. So um, the way that I'm going to read what, a, a piece of a paper that I wrote, um, the way that I express my dimology then, and it's still probably pretty accurate, um, is this. So I said panoramic view, right? So wide open. Trust in good intentions, and not just my good intentions, trust in everybody's good intentions. Um, that's part of the care team in this context, the nurses, the doctors, the aides, the physical therapists, um, and the patient. Trust in everybody's good intentions and belief in their basic goodness. Um, reliance on personal effort. Uh, this is not, you know, just um, any volunteer work, this takes time, it takes effort, it takes thought, it takes preparation. Um, having meditations, readings, practices, and activities that generate and embody a heartfelt compassion. Um, so that's part of the preparation and is ongoing. A deep understanding and practicing the perfections, and particularly the four perfections perfections that we say in our prayers every Sunday, kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. And being able to show up wherever I am and meet each person just where they are. Um, lots easier said than done, but you know that's the aspiration. And of course, at the core of all of this is the truth of impermanence and interdependence. So that's sort of the summary of this multi-page paper that I wrote back in 2018. Um, my co-volunteers um, have very different theologies. I mean, we all meet right in in what we were what I just expressed, but most of my co-volunteers are Christian, um, but they come from very different settings. Um, one woman I've become quite good friends with is a very devout Catholic. And she is um, authorized to give the Eucharist. So that's what she does in the hospital. Other than just visit, she's able to give mass or the Eucharist. Um, we have evangelical Christians as part of the care team, chaplaincy care team. Uh, we have Muslims. 
um, a woman with a new age practice that I'm not quite sure that I understand, but you know, that's what she's grounded in. And one of the men is grounded in 12 step. That is his practice. That's what grounds him. So it's a wide variety of people who come to, to practice chaplaincy. Um, the main thing though, is that each of us is grounded and guided by a personal theology. So, this leads me into the actual practice of being a volunteer hospital chaplain. And so, how does that work? Um, after some initial shadowing and, of resident chaplains and the supervisors, we're let loose to go visit patients on our own. Um, we get a current list of patients on whatever floor we're assigned to for that shift. Um, since we're sent to many different floors and we don't know where we're gonna go until we get there, we meet all sorts of different kinds of patients. Um, cardiac, transplant, trauma, like car crashes and falls. Um, UC Davis is a county teaching hospital, so we get a lot of homeless, a lot of people experiencing homeless, and they experience any number of different kinds of issues. Um, cancer patients, diabetics who are facing amputations, um, people with lupus. I mean, I got to tell you, I had no idea of what the human body can go through. I mean, it's just just vast. Um, so I think that's what Lama meant when he was talking last week, uh, when he said we have to be prepared to be unprepared. Um, it's frequently different floors and always a new patient. I have seldom seen the same person twice. Um, it's, I think, what in Zen they call don't know mind, right? That's what you have every time you enter the door. So we have this floor list and we go to the floor. So the first thing you do is you check in with the head nurse um, or at least somebody um, who's at the front desk to let them know that you're, you're on the floor. And is there anybody in particular they think that, you, that needs a visit from a chaplain? And frequently there is. And so I go see those people first. Um, and then you just start doing rounds. It's, like cold call, you just walk into the room. So everyone has to develop an approach uh, to introduce ourselves to the patients. And often there's visiting family and friends in the room. And so there's, you've got to be able to have a way of entering the door, sort of with your elevator speech, right? Um, in a friendly and non-threatening way, letting them know that you know, hi, my name is Chaplain Susan, and uh, I'm part of the care team. So I'm here to just see how you're doing. Would you like to have someone to talk to? Just um, what's going on with you right now? And you'd be amazed, you know, if you're just kind of casual, or at least I am, I try to be casual, but interested and curious and really focused on them. Um, and let them know that what we are there for is for emotional and spiritual perspective. You know, and we're not we're not medical people at all, and so we, we don't even pretend to be. Um, sometimes they say, "No thanks, I'm good." I'm like, Ooh, go away," <laughs> you know. Um, but often, just as often, they say, "Oh, thanks for coming." Yeah, I could really use a prayer. I could really use someone to chat with and use a prayer. Or they'll say, yeah, yeah, I, I'd love to have someone to talk to. Pull up a chair. And then they just start talking. You know, life review. They start telling you about their family or about their job or about why they're in there. And, you know, you just listen and kind of guide the conversation and, and try, to, try, to, try to get them to bring out you know, what's, what's going on right now? How are you feeling? How are you, how, what, what's your support system? You know, where do you go to for your strength? 
So you just, anyway, it's just, just conversations. Um, no two encounters are really ever the same. Some days they'll get mostly no thanks, I'm fine. And some days, um, well, most days are pretty mixed. I'll get someone who, one or two people who just want to talk, several people who want prayer. One of Lama's statements last week that kind of encapsulates, I think, this experience is that the container of compassion and insight just keeps getting bigger. Um, these experiences increase my capacity and my knowledge every week. So just some examples. Um, most visits are, you know, three, five, 10 minutes, you know, not long. So you can see a lot of people in the course of three or four hours. Um, but one woman in particular comes to mind, and I spent 30, maybe 40 minutes with her. And this is a woman who was experiencing homelessness. She was not living on county or city land, so she wasn't harassed in that way. She was um, kind of secure for how it is that she lived. But all she, she did, she just talked to me about how it was she lived. She told me about the friends that she had, about people who would bring her ice for her ice chest so that her food didn't spoil, people who would bring her water, people who would bring her propane so that she was able to cook. Um, she told me about how She told me about how very hard the winters are. And how her dogs allowed her to sleep at night. They were her security. Um, she just broke my heart open. It was truly amazing. Sorry, I did not expect this to happen. Anyway, so towards the end of the conversation, um, she said, you know, maybe you can you can give me a prayer. And I said, sure. What would you like to pray about? That's frequently what we ask. What do you want? To, what would you like to pray about? And she wanted to pray for her friends and her dogs, that everybody was well and safe. Now, this was a woman who was experiencing coming out of a really life-threatening emergency. And, you know, she, she just wanted to pray for her friends and her dogs. Anyway, it was, it was very moving. There was a guy, uh, you get paged, so I carry a pager usually. And there was a guy in ICU um, that the nurses wanted a chaplain. He had not asked for a chaplain. The nurses did. Um, because he was just, um, he had suddenly been blinded. A young man. I had no idea how old he was, but he was young, you know, 20s, 30s. Um, his face was just a mess. His eyelids were stitched closed. Um, and he was so angry and just in a total state of shock, as you can imagine, and, and so frightened and so angry, he couldn't speak. He just didn't want to speak. I mean, I tried to, you know, introduce myself and talk a little bit. And he just mm -mm, wanted nothing to do with me at all. And but the nurses really felt that he needed somebody there. So I said, well, would you like me to read to you? And he nodded. So I always carry a Bible with me. And um, I don't know the Bible, by the way, at all. You know, I just, um, but I do know Psalms. I just always turn to Psalms because that's, that's a really safe place to be reading from. And um, so I just started reading to him. I probably read to him for 10, 15 minutes. And then I noticed he was asleep and then I left. But he was just so, so agitated. And I, at least, gave him a little bit of, of quiet time. 
So that was a tough one. Um, and then there was a room again where um, I was paged to where the woman had just died, the patient had just died and her longtime partner and one of her children were present. And the rest of the family was due to arrive any minute, so they had been called and they were close. So while we were waiting for them, her partner held her hand and stroked her arm and just told me about her. She had been a musician, she had been a teacher, she had been, and just told me all sorts of things about her life. So by the time the rest of the family arrived, I knew a fair amount about her, at least, you know, a little bit. So when the rest of the family arrived, and it was, you know, good half dozen, six, you know, eight people, there was a lot of us in the room. It was a little bit awkward. They didn't know what to do. But that's why the chaplain's there. You know, that's why we were called. So what I did is I just had everybody hold hands and I held the partner's hand and I put my other hand on the patient and just prayed for support, for comfort, for love. People, I invited people to share and they did. It's mostly their mom or their grandma. Um, they just said a memory, but in that way, they just kind of came together around this woman who had just passed. And when we said amen, then I left, but the room was, you know, there was a presence there. And then the rest of the care team came in and, and did what it is that the social workers and the nurses need to do. Um, so there's a story, you know, like every week, um, what the chaplains are there for is to remind folks that what's happening is not just a physical event. It's emotional and it's spiritual. And we try to provide a safe space for people to express their feelings, to tell their life stories, and to know that they've been listened to um, with no judgment and with compassion. So you may be wondering what is with all this Bible and prayer stuff? You know, I mean, I'm a Buddhist, right? What's with all this Christian stuff? Well, the fact is, is this is basically a Christian country for the most part, right? And that's what people are familiar with. So chaplaincy means, as Lama said last week, giving benefit and help to people who may or may not be on any particular spiritual path, being open to all sorts of different people who want help. So being Buddhist and grounded in Buddhist theology, but practicing with a Christian or a Muslim or a new age spiritualist or somebody who just loves the mountains, just loves being outdoors. What that takes is um, a Vajrayana approach. It's an approach that requires imagination, creativity, and a lot of energy. Um, you use whatever available tools with a very inclusive, an energetic outlook and the tools are always increasing and I'm always learning something always always so that's hospital chaplaincy in a nutshell um Geshe Damcho and I um have also visited people in their homes and held services for um somebody people who have departed and the family's not Buddhist but the guy um, and the woman who departed were, and so we held services for them. Um, we have visited the hospital together uh, for sick as well as for um, a death. Um, we held a large memorial service here, maybe 2018, I think, 2019. Um, Lama has done graveside services. So there's lots of different ways to you know, that we've been expressing chaplaincy. So 
Let's see what time is it? Okay, so before I open this up to Ellen to express her, her uh, comments, and then for other folks, I wanted to introduce briefly uh, an idea about making Lions Roars chaplaincy program a little more robust. And this was catalyzed by our friend Brad by a question he asked Lama three, four weeks ago. So um, on the first Friday of the month, um, Doug and I hold a medicine Buddha practice here. I think it starts at 630. Yeah, yeah, it's 630 on the first Friday of the month. Um, and so we're kind of hoping that that will become the centerpiece, if you will, for an expanded chaplaincy program. And um, a practice that I'm hoping that more people can find some meaning and some benefit from. Um, so please, the next one is December 2nd at, that's the first Friday in December at 6.30. And um, if you would consider coming, because I'd like to get, we'd like to get some input. How can we make it more meaningful to you? Um, I'm going, I have not done this yet, and he doesn't know this, but I'm going to ask Yessi Damcho if he would be willing to come and lead the practice, at least um, occasionally. Um, but we'd like to hear from you. What, what would make the practice more meaningful for you? so that we can make that kind of a centerpiece um, of a chaplaincy program. Um, another piece that we were thinking about introducing, many temples and monasteries have a, an active prayer list book that's just sitting out like, you know, somewhere in the entryway it's for people to write the names of uh, people they know or animals who have recently passed or who are very ill. Um, and we add that as a dedication when we do the medicine Buddha practice. When I do the medicine Buddha practice at home, I have a dedication um, piece where I, I'm dedicating it to people I know who are ill. Um, we also have that available online where we are, you know, people can send names in to the info email address and um, Jen who who um, monitors that email will get that to us and we'll add that to the medicine Buddha practice so anyway i'm thinking i'm going to try to see if i can find some cool book that you know will and invite people to to add uh, names to a prayer list and finally and you know again none of this is really fleshed out yet but we'd like to expand a home visit program so sort of outreach to folks um, who want a practice in their home. They're too sick to leave or, you know, something is making them, uh, requiring them to stay home. They can't leave. They can't come to temple. They're isolated for some reason. Um, and they'd like to have, you know, someone, two or three people even, come and visit just to talk and maybe do a practice with them. Chen Rezi. Uh, medicine Buddha, something like that. So anyway, that's my aspiration for 2023 is to sort of see if I can't help us build a, a outreach chaplaincy program and to um, beef up and get a, a real vital um, medicine Buddha practice going. So um, in 2018, Shadow Rinpoche was here and he held a ceremony to ordain a few Lions War members as chaplains. Um, and Ellen and I were among that group. Um, Patty was also. So um, I want to open it up a little bit to see if Ellen wants to add something. I'll just, I'll just come here and sit by you if you don't mind. Um, thank you, Susan. It, it was really interesting to hear your talk and um, all the work you do. And thank you in particular for your service because, you know, I can imagine being a chaplain and having that time and wherewithal and willingness to go serve in that way. And I'm, I don't do that, but that's, it's big and it takes a lot. Um, but thank you for inviting me to share my 
my approach and perspective and what I've done with this, you know, this label chaplain, because I think it's quite different. And I think um, maybe what it'll do is hopefully let people know that it can look very different. Um, and as you were talking, I was thinking about all the differences. And I guess the, the first one is I never intended to become a chaplain. It, it was just one of those things that you find yourself having done because the Lama asks you to do it. Um, you know, I had been at Lions for quite a while and a number of us did this study group through FPMT. And I think he decided that was a good sort of prerequisite to being a chaplain. So maybe he, maybe he rounded up everybody that had completed that and he said, come be a chaplain. Um, so I did and, and I, I thought, well, you know, maybe someday I would do something like Susan's doing. But in the meantime, you know, I still have a day job. I still have a family responsibilities. I fill my life up with all sorts of other diversions. So I haven't made myself available to do something like that. And I know for a little while I was like, well, shoot, I feel a little bit out of integrity that I've been given this, you know, chaplain crown and I'm not doing it. Um, but I think I, I came to peace with that and I really resonated with what Bradley said the other day, maybe two weeks ago or whenever we were first started talking about chaplaincy. I find a lot of um, satisfaction value in just hanging out with people. Um, I think there there's a pretty big need even among the sangha of uh you know for for the kinds of things that chaplains can offer and um just in thinking a little bit about you know what does it take to be a chaplain i think that one of the biggest things you already all have and it's compassion i mean it's it's a self-selected property of people that show up in the room here and then as you practice your compassion grows more and more so one who has this compassion just notices things you know they just notice when somebody needs something and i i think that's probably the biggest motivator for being a chaplain and acting in that sort of way i think from mama's perspective and it is a bit helpful having some capacity then right action right speech are probably the the biggest ones you know being willing to be with somebody and be show up in a way that that works for them have it be about them you know, and over my career and life, I've worked, tried to work more and more at being a good listener, you know, have it be about them and not about me. And I think that that helps one to serve. But um, I'm, I'm interested in being helpful, however I can, and it shows up in different ways than what, you know, the ways that Susan provides chaplaincy. But I think one of the things in thinking about it that I realized is everybody can can be a chaplain. And, and the best way is to do it in a way that works for you, you know, that speaks to you. Who do you resonate with and, and what kinds of acti activities light you up? You know, if you do those, then you'll really be in integrity um, in, in the chaplaincy role. So, um, you know, I'll notice maybe when one of the people that I've met here and connected with, when they're not here anymore, you know, we're, they haven't been here for a while. Well, so, you know, send them a text. And I, I don't do it for everybody because I don't know everybody that well. You know, I'm not on that kind of rapport with everybody. But the people I know, when they stop coming, well, you know, what's up with them? Or maybe they've decided to even leave Lion's Roar. I probably spend just as much time with people that aren't practicing anymore because those people are having a hard time, you know, if for no other reason that they've just lost their community because they've made a different choice, you know, still that's a big loss for them. Um, I do things I love. A lot of you who know me know that I like the outdoors. I find the outdoors to be very healing. Anybody that likes the outdoors, maybe I invite them to go for a hike or hang out, you know, in, in a natural setting. If you've seen the places that I like to live and hang out, you know that I like that around me so I can share that with people. And just thinking about people and three things Susan said, and I maybe wouldn't have put them exactly the same, but essentially the same. You know, it's a, it's a tough world out there these days. And what do people need? I think they need comfort. I think you said comfort, support, and maybe love or something in, in one of the parts you're talking about. Everybody likes comfort, you know, whatever that might be. Um, maybe it's, maybe it's a, a fresh baked muffin, you know, maybe you went to the grocery store and bought some good apples and you you say, hey, I have these nice apples, would you like one? Just, you know, comfort kinds of stuff support i think is big you know what's going on with you like susan said she just asked people 
what do you want to talk? What do you need? What would be helpful? You know, to think about what is supportive for people. Sometimes it's cleaning the floor when somebody's moving out of their apartment. You know, it can look all different ways. It really can. And then when you're cleaning that floor, you get to hear a little bit about what's up for that person. Um, and then I think, I, I think you use the word love, but I might not be remembering it like right. But I think connection, you know, we get connection with one another here. And that's why I've, I especially find it rewarding to, to talk to Sangha members. We get connection and we can grow that. And sometimes, even though we're part of this Sangha, or you might know somebody through another community, one can feel very alone. You know, you can feel isolated. And so sometimes just that personal outreach um, can make you feel, you know, like you're not so alone. And I think people can really use that now. So I don't do that much. Um, again, you know, I'm just kind of busy. I keep my head down, I'm kind of an introvert. But I think it is so important these days to provide those things to people and, and everybody can do it. So um, I'm really glad that Lama is focusing on this. And I think I, my recommendation would be to not be off put by the label. The label isn't particularly meaningful, you know. Um, I think that maybe we need to think about what that label means, because I think it is just a sort of a, a willingness to be of service that anybody that's on sort of a bodhisattva path is obviously willing to do. So those are some thoughts I had. So that was really great. Thank you, Ellen. Um, so let's open it up. What, what, is your, what are your thoughts, Dan? Uh, thank you for the talk and for your service as well. Um, I was just kind of wondering if, um, like, how do you draw the line? You're there to support them emotionally and spiritually, but especially like within the hospital setting, I can imagine that there's things that you can see that, you know, like that the, the staff might be able to do different. Like, how do you avoid advocating maybe for the patient with the staff or with their family to try to change things? Like, how do you avoid like getting actually in there and like, you know, speaking your own mind about what's going on, you know, wanting them, to, you know, you want to help the patient, you want to make make things better for them, but maybe you see the staff isn't maybe treating them quite right, or maybe their family is treating them in a bad way. How do you not get all wrapped up in that? And second to that is, how do you cap your time like that? I can imagine some people would want you for a long time, you know, so how do you extract yourself from the situation? Okay, a second question first. Um, I carry a pager, and so if somebody is telling me a life story and they're 80 years old and they start when they went to first grade, <laughs> you know, um, I, I know it's going to be a long one. And, um, you know, you try to steer the conversation to be you know, a little more relevant to why they're in the hospital the fact that they've got you know a leg missing or something um but i can always just say ah i got i gotta take this and i'll pull the pager out you know and they totally understand i mean everybody has a pager so um yeah it does happen right um the other question you know it is way not my place or i'm part of a team so i would never question anything the nurses do i would never question anything that the doctors do um, i might hear that they could use a social worker and i'll suggest have they seen the social worker yeah because i don't I, as a volunteer i don't get to see the electronic record so i don't know anything about what's going on really and so I will, I have mentioned that, have they seen a social worker? And frequently, yeah, they have. I mean, you know, these people are on top of it. They know their stuff. So um, if I have a particularly difficult patient, I know that the nurse also is having a particular difficult patient. And so if I can find him or her will talk because that nurse is also frustrated 
that nurse also needs to be listened to, right? So um, I'm part of that team. I am not an advocate in any way, shape or form for the patient because I don't know. I don't know. I have not read their medical record. I don't have access to it. And I would never assume that the nurses have not picked up on what I've picked up on. And so I'll, I'll frequently just seek them out. Who's, who's, you know, 37 bed one, who's the nurse? And it's written up there, and I'll, you know. So we'll, we'll chat maybe. And yeah, he or she has pretty much already picked up on what I've picked up on. Yeah, and they need to talk sometimes too, it's tough. There's a wall back there. Hi, I, I was involved in a wonderful chaplaincy program when I was young. It was, it was in 1985 and it was, it was in the middle of the AIDS epidemic in uh, San Francisco General. And uh, I joined up with the program and then the first thing is they all decided I was too much of a lightweight for the AIDS ward. So they all, all the guys got to go to the AIDS wards, but uh, the others, the rest of us, they assigned by floor. And I, I was assigned to the orthopedic floor, which is broken bones. And I had two different guys, two young guys in different rooms who had each jumped out of a third floor window while high on cocaine. <laughs> First off, I thought, well, they should put these guys in together and they can have a chat. But, uh, but I was able to share with them because I have been in AA for forever. Uh, I was able to share with them. What's an AA? Al Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, I was able to share with them recovery and don't jump out of windows anymore and uh and that sort of thing but it was uh it was it was so striking that these two guys ended up on the same floor in the same window the same drug and uh but it was a wonderful program it was uh uh in those days mostly mostly uh christian and uh but from all over the place and it was just a great program it was a great uh the, Greatest thing for me was when all the chaplains got together in a room and were able to share with each other all the in interesting things that that I, they had encountered and all. But the other thing I discovered was uh, that people love to talk about what's going on. They they want to sit there and talk about their drugs and the and and all the different things that people were doing to their bodies. You know, I could just sit there all afternoon and then they tell me all this stuff. So that was kind of fun too. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you do bring up a really good point that um, being part of a group of people who um, that you can sit and listen and learn from is really important. And it's something that I'm able to do at UC Davis. We get together pretty frequently and study and discuss. And, and um, it's very, very important to have that kind of support um, and so that's part of, I think, what I'm hoping, again, is my aspiration for 2023 is to, to sort of build something like that. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much for your talk, Susan. It, um, it's incredibly brave to walk into somebody's room without an agenda and just be like open. You know, and as, as a nurse, I like have all these tasks to do, you know, and, and it's, it's, uh, you know, approaching people emotionally seems like a really brave thing to do. And I really admire, you know, your ability to do that. So I have an interesting experience from um, a patient slash family members view, you know, and my, my wife was uh, in 2018, she had this really dramatic stroke, and she was incredibly ill. And she spent like 40 something days in the hospital. And it's kind of crazy because you, um, you know, you have family that come and visit and you have people that come and visit, but you spend all this time alone, you know, and I would spend my time trying to read Dharma books and recite mantras and try to be productive, but there's all this time that you're alone. And there was a guy that was a, um, a chaplain who um, came in and he was very Christian and I identified as Buddhist. 
and we didn't talk about religion at all. He, um, you know, he talked to me and he asked me about my family and my son was running cross country at the time. And I ran cross country in high school and I, and I really, um, I really loved that time of my life. And I was really excited for my son running cross country. And this guy was a runner and he was from, you know, some, one of the African countries and he ran in college. And so he, um, he realized that that was something that I was interested in and, and, and I was excited about. So we talked all about cross country. And when he showed up the next time, it was like, I felt like, oh, wow, here's this guy that I know, you know, and I, and I only talked to him one time, but it was so interesting how that was like, it took this pressure off of me that I had, you know, just for like a little bit of time, like I felt relief from this impending thing that was going on that was really traumatic. And, and it was really skillful on his part yeah, yeah. that he, that he was able to like, just pluck that right out and go, Oh, here's this thing that, that we can relate together on. That's like, you know, that um, may not seem on the surface, like it's very important, but it gave me some relief for just a little while. And that was, that was really interesting thinking back on that. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's, that's something for me to learn from and connection. Yeah. That's what, what, Ellen was talking about was connection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I like your talk, Susan. And as you know, that I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay. I liked your talk, Susan. And as you know, you're volunteering in hospital in you can run into some pretty extreme um, situations, sometimes unpleasant. You can do a lot of good in the hospital, but there are other places that you can be a chaplain informally where it's not so extreme. It's easier to deal with. I work as a volunteer in a museum that attracts a lot of people who are technical engineers and have a very technical side to them, mainly men. I'm one of the few women in, in the program. And to some degree, it's like a social club, but we are docents, so we have to provide education. Uh, but this is a group of of people who are, I would say the average age is 78. So they, they die. And their families die. And uh, I find informally, uh, that I listen a lot. And just through listening, kindly, you can, and being sympathetic, you can provide a lot of, of support that way. And a group of friends, these guys that I work with, um, uh, I find that they look to me for when they want to talk about their feelings about something, or they're having a dilemma, or um, it's very informal, but these things are, can be extremely helpful. And I would encourage anybody who's, I mean, you could maybe not do this in your workplace, but in an informal club of some sort, if you just uh, listen sympathetically, you can um, care for a lot of people. Yeah, great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, right. Anywhere and everywhere. You meet people wherever you are, wherever they are. Anybody online got a hand up? Autumn does. Hmm? Autumn does. Oh, okay. Autumn. Oh, and then Kathy too. Hi. Can you hear me? Thanks for your talk. I've been really interested in all of this. Uh, talk about chaplaincy. I'm definitely interested in 
trying to see where I might fit in and something like that. Um, it, it may sound strange, but it does remind me a lot of my work as a journalist. Um, we were always going into situations that of high intensity and talking with people. Um, sometimes that it just, you know, in just horrible situations, you know, their home just burnt down or someone got murdered or just terrible situations or poverty I mean anything and you know as a journalist you're supposed to remain unbiased and so I was never there to give advice but what I did learn that um, through all of that was the very simple act of listening and bearing witness compassionate witness to what someone was going through it, it meant a lot to people just to be heard and I never gave advice you know that was never the the job but just an eye contact and really listening it's kind of incredible what that what that can mean to people in those situations in their lives um so that's all I just wanted to add. And then also I did do some work as a doula in a hospital, which is kind of interesting because in most, in most of those uh, situations, it is a happy event, but there's all this distress sometimes around the birthing process. And again, it could be a complete, it was always a complete stranger that you'd walk into a really intense time in their life but again like there's no advice just being present it's it, it kind of blows my mind that just being present for someone can be so powerful that's all I was going to say thank you Kathy did I see you raise your hand yeah thank you so much for your talk and everybody that is shared, I, I just wanna say that I have been on the receiving end of the generosity uh, coming into Lion's Roar when I did. Um, there has not been one time, I can't even think of one time I've ever been to an event, to a Dharma talk, to you know all the things that we did that I have not come away with so much support and anytime I struggle you know I struggle a lot with technical stuff I struggle a lot with kind of putting myself out there and I constantly get this support from every person that I encounter. And I just have to say that, you know, we might think that it's not happening, but it is for somebody who's pretty shy and introverted. Um, I come away every time I leave Lion's Roar or any event that I've met with any of you outside of Lion's Roar that I just didn't feel like my vessel got completely filled. So I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, reiterating, I guess, um, from a recipient's point of view, that we're all chaplains all the time, right? So what's the definition of that word, as Ellen was asking? I, I like uh, liked your aspirations, Susan, and I'd like to offer some friendly additions to it. Um, because I think one of the things that's a little bit challenging is we don't always know within our Sangha anyway, or even, you know, broader community, we don't always know when somebody has a need. Um, you know, a lot of us are sort of silent sufferers, right? So we just try to grunt through it, but we don't know. Um, and as I think it was Bradley again that said, you know, sometimes it'd just be nice to practice with somebody. And I've had the best time just like practicing onesie twosies when I've done it with people. It's so nice practice outside or what have you, but you don't know. And I've always yearned for a, a you know, a, 
I don't know, a better network, a, a better way to share ideas about what somebody might need, you know, for those of us that know one another, because we don't talk to everybody all the time, right? So Patty's pretty good about it. Patty's like this little intelligence machine, and she'll reach out and say, I think somebody's having a hard time. But to, to try to f strengthen that network, you know, so if somebody knows that somebody's having a hard time or needs something, that there'd be a way to share that, kind of like your prayer book, but not just for prayer. Maybe for practice, for a walk, for coffee. Um, so I'd love to see us figure out a way. And we've we've toyed from time to time. Oh, let's have a call list, you know, where we split up the whole sangha and we walk down the call list. We could do that, but maybe somebody know. You know, maybe I hear that somebody's having a hard time, but I'm kind of busy myself and I don't do anything with that piece of data. You know, and I can pass it along. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so some way mm -hmm. in our sangha to provide the kind of um, experience that Kathy has to somebody that maybe needs a little bit more, you know, initiation on our part. All right. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then, um, Sue, who's on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I, I so admire you for what you do. I imagine it can be quite draining. Um, yeah, it depends on the day, painful. but it can yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> but also rewarding. I mean, it's a, a give and take, right? Yeah. I'm sure you get a lot out of it too for yourself. I know I do. If I'm, if I try to be helpful, I feel great. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if Morris Newman is a chaplain. He's one of our Sangha members mm -hmm. here. Is he a chaplain? Well, I is as we all are yeah well, well okay yeah. i wanted to share my experience Please. and share my gratitude to him i see that he's not online either so maybe well he knows how grateful i am <laughs> um so when i moved back to sacramento from the bay area back in 2017 or 18 and i started coming here i moved in with my father he needed a lot of care um, and he used to come here, some of you might remember my dad, he, um, he, he came on Sundays, I, I would bring him here, and sometimes we went to the Wednesday night beginning meditation mm -hmm. group as well. Um, Morris, he, he knew how, my dad was a very sweet and the most sensitive person I've ever known really sweet and caring and sensitive but if you were in his really small tiny inner circle um he I, it was like if i had that picture that Lama talked about that you need to keep refilling to fill the glass m my picture was constantly empty you know I, I couldn't get couldn't fill it the only way to fill it was to to leave come here you know <laughs> I got a lot of refills here at Temple. Um, but it could be very, very difficult to be in his very small inner circle. So Morris, bless his heart, he offered to come and visit my dad at our house and spend some time with him, maybe an hour, and just to talk, like, like you said, just to talk, not preach, not nothing, just talk. And his intent at that time was to give me some peace so I could leave the house because my father um, got to a point where he didn't want me to leave the house ever. He would come out in the driveway and yell to have me come back. And it was very, very difficult. And so Morris wanted to help me. So. <laughs> Under the guise of helping my dad, he he was doing this to help me. But at first, my dad wouldn't want, didn't want me to leave. So he said, no, you have to stay. <laughs> kind of defeated the whole purpose. But eventually, Morris got him to, he didn't even want Morris. I mean, Morris is a wonderful person. Um, but my dad has a, had a um, fear of men 
pretty much. So he, he didn't want a man coming into the house, but I talked him into having Morris, but he didn't want me to leave. But eventually, um, the dad would let me leave the house so I could have an hour to go someplace and, and come back, recharge and come back. And then uh, when my father ended up in the skilled nursing facility, well, Morris kept going to visit him. I didn't need that space anymore because I had it. So my dad had me, I would visit as often as I could. And once in a while, Morris would go and visit as well and just spend some time with him and talk to him. And then COVID came along, so neither of us could go anymore. Um, but at least Morris was able to um, reach my dad's heart to where it was okay to have him visit without me there. I, I just wanted to express my gratitude. And so what he did was chaplaincy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So. Beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. <laughs> okay. So maybe we'll do closing prayers and. Oh, no.